Kilkenomics 2012, Kilkenny, I'm with Konstantin Gurdjieff. Thank you so much for giving me some of your time. Anytime. If I can start by asking you how or when you first came across uh, Joseph Brodsky's work and how that's affected your life. Ah, Joseph Brodsky, very interesting. I mean, when, of course, I grew up in the Soviet Union um, and uh, I remember the days, you know, when I was in high school and uh, you would get a ha your hands on the poetry of the likes of Tsutaeva, um, which wasn't banned officially, but was never really published in the mm -hmm. Soviet Union itself. And uh, I remember developing skills using typewriter with a carbon paper, and you literally type out poems and you give somebody else a copy, and they give the copy that they typed out themselves. And I came across a few poems of Brodsky. They were early poems of Brodsky from his Archangelsk region, you know, Mormon's region period, you know, when he was in exile. Um, they were naive, they were uh, beautifully written um, to Russian, uh, in Russian language, Russian poetry has to have both the form and the substance. And Brodsky had those hints early on in his poetry which were tremendously powerful in terms of philosophical content. Um, but I didn't appreciate it then. When I came to the United States and uh, I was living in Los Angeles, um, a friend of mine at the time gave me as the birthday present one of the artist's first publications of Brodsky. Uh, I remember, I still have it, it's a series of soft copies that they produced, um, which were first editions of his uh, poems, and uh, they were in Russian, um, and it was a little little blue, I don't remember which one of uh, Brodsky's books it was, the first one that I got from uh, that, and I was absolutely blown away by reading it in Russian. I was blown away and I started searching for more of his books, <clears throat> and I found... Um, an English language edition um, and I read it in English and I realized that like Nabokov in prose Brodsky combined an absolutely unparalleled ability of writing in both languages mm -hmm. uh, poetry doesn't translate well at all so for example reading great poets like Czeslaw Milish uh, Wislaw Zimborska uh, reading them uh, in English is entirely different than reading them in their original languages, whether it's Polish, you know, you know yeah, or other languages as well. Um, Brodsky had that ability of seamlessly both translating and writing in both languages, and it is a, an amazing ability. Um, he brought into the English language the capacity of Russian verse mm -hmm. to be formalistically um, in form terms. Uh, as beautiful as content-wise. As I grew myself, you know, in terms of studying mathematics, studying uh, economics, um, I discovered that to me Brodsky became an effectively an infinite source of philosophical discourse. Mm -hmm. You can read his poetry like a mathematician. For example, you know, you take his, you know, lines about what do you like most in life, you know, rivers and streets, the longest things of life, you know. Uh, the longer things of life, and you can treat it as the purely descriptive concept, like a painting which is visually, you know, conveys the form. Yet when you start thinking about the relationship between the time and distance, and you start relating it to the relationship that the human dimension brings to it, no longer the concept of time and distance has traveled, but rather is lived, you all of a sudden into the set theory of mathematics, you know, because you have the conception of dimensions in it, which are relative on a small scale, but absolute on the scale in which you take it once you assign to it the value of that scale. Mm -hmm. What it means is really, if you think about time in terms of how we live on an everyday basis, time is continuously flowing. Time is only makes sense as one hour succeeds another. When you take your entire life span, especially, you know, you can't take it once you're dead, so you have to take it as you're living. There is, there is past and there is future. There is no really present. Mm -hmm. Because present is instantaneously becomes past, mm -hmm. okay? On that scale, the continuation or continuity of minutes and hours makes no sense. And it's a continuity like distance as well. You know, when you look at, for example, at the object which is five meters from you, it's an object which is five meters from you. When you look at the object on the horizon, you don't assign to it the kilometers. 
distance becomes entirely different, okay? Things like that, embedded in Brodsky's poetry, um, the closest to person, uh, of a person to Brodsky to me in poetry would be, again, out of Brodsky's circle of people, um, would be Thomas Wenzlova. Um, and it's, a, you know, or, you know, Derek Walcott, for example. Um, but it is an amazing capacity. I mean, I travel, you know, pretty much any time I'm traveling. I bring with me my work, you know, I bring with me maybe, you know, uh, a newspaper or something else. Um, I might bring a book to read, but I always bring Brodsky because um, it is the best way of switching your mind into something entirely different. Uh, and when you are tired of doing, for example, economics or you're tired of uh, reading about, you know, um, financial markets or something else, you know, you open Brodsky and you read just one poem and it doesn't matter whether you know it by heart. You constantly deep into some different dimension. Your state of mind puts you into a different world because Brodsky's poetry is so broad, so rich, that you have the capacity to fill yourself with it. It is like in the visual arts, very few painters who attain that, for example, or sculptors who attain that. Um, I mean, the examples are not the likes of Picasso, which we all think of, you know, but examples are like Mark Tanzi, for example. Um, where you look at the painting and at the first look um, you you are hit with the visual mm. at the second time you look at it you start digging deeper you go beyond into the meanings mm. it's like reading Bulgakov uh, first time the plot captivates you this on the second reading what captivates you is actually what you start discover in yourself as a result of you interacting with the book and on the third time you discover the history and on the fourth time you discover the human uh, capacity and human value and on the fifth time you go back to personal. Mm -hmm. It is amazing. I think, you know, Brodsky to me is a fantastic guy. I travel a lot to Venice. Um, myself and my wife, you know, we have a family connection to outside of Venice and we're very often in Venice itself. And I look at Venice now through Brodsky's eyes. I, interesting enough, when I was reading first uh, about his travels in Venice, I looked at his Venice with my childhood eyes of remembering Venice in winter, remembering the space, you know, the light and all, and there. So again, you interact with Brodsky as if it is a friend. Is that Brodsky's entire being is about space as us. And he defines the poetry in terms of the relationship between the human being and space. And by doing so, and doing so consistently and persistently throughout poetry and also prose, but I mean mo much more in literary criticism, much more through, <clears throat> through poetry, he shows us ultimately the concepts which are, can only be understood and can only be approached through the true, what I call true arts, philosophy, mathematics, and what we call traditionally art. These are the concepts of true real, relativity of time, for example. Concepts of uh, our own existence and inexistence. <clears throat> if you think about the absolute zero in mathematics, absolute zero in life is absence of me. Mm -hmm. um, there is no biological science which can ever deal with the concept of absence of me. It only is domain of philosophy and of mathematics and of poetry. Mm -hmm. um, Brodsky does it perfectly well. This is why Brodsky's work can be taken out physically, out of its temporal existence in any point in time, and put into an entirely different setting and presented to entirely different people. And there will be commonality which automatically, intrinsically emerge from it. And that commonality is in this global scale of his thing. Yes, yes, yes. And if you think about um, I all, you know, Brodsky introduced me to Odin. By reading Brodsky and then reading his literary criticism, I've rediscovered Odin. Odin to me has always been a very strange poet, similar to the group of poets who would have been around Brodsky in his circle as well, uh, with the exception of Venslova. Um, all of them, the likes of Zimborska, for example, the likes of Milish, the likes of um, Walcott, all of them, to me, like Odin, are the poets where the brilliance is the momentary brilliance. Mm -hmm. It is 
the brilliance which happens is like almost like a spike, you know? Like, I mean, as an economist, I work with the outliers and you see a lot, you know, outliers is something that jumps to you in the data. Mm -hmm. The same is what jumps to you in their poetry. There's tremendous concentrated moments of sublime merger between the philosophical content and the form. Brodsky is unique in the sense that absolutely every verse is the sublime merger of form and content. There is no other poet that I know of other than perhaps Marina Tsvitaeva who have achieved that. Pasternak never achieved that really. Again, it's kind of, you know, you have those peaks and then you have throws, you have the poet, there are lines which are there to merge together the lines of greatness.